This is the Titan Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. Its mission, deliver a payload to a designated spot on the Earth's surface some 5,500 nautical miles away. Its warhead could level an entire city. Okay, so welcome back to Nuclear Bunker Living. So, as I mentioned before, we have two special guests here. These uh, gentlemen are the trailblazers of the other uh, missile silo uh, complexes. In fact, we've got um, we've got Bruce Francisco, uh, who is the uh, the trailblazer, the OG of the LSF, and we also have GT from Deathwish Bunny Slippers, also known as uh, TitanRange.com. Uh, and he basically pioneered, and uh, he's a trailblazer for the Titan II. Okay, so welcome to the uh, Titan One. We are in the Power Dome. Uh, we've got the water treatment plant over here, built in Glendale, California. But uh, this space is pretty impressive, very vast, massive. And we're all talking about the um, the other uh, gauntlet of challenges and uh, the massive undertaking. And somewhat like you know, if you're going to renovate a Titan One, it's also like a curse too, right? Yep. Because it's, there's a lot of steel, a lot of concrete, a lot of space, a lot of volume. But you also need um, a significant budget in order to basically just sort of clean it out for remediation and then start the, uh, the repurposing monetization model kind of thing. But um, we'll talk about the title one afterwards, but obviously I want to like, um, you know, hats off to you guys. You guys were the trailblazers. In fact, you know, when I was looking at the silos, I mean, I was basically spending time on your YouTube channel yeah. and your YouTube channel back in the day kind of thing. And um, so my question to you, and obviously for, for the viewers too, is like, GT, first up, why did you choose a Titan II? Yeah, there's a number of factors that go into that. Yeah. Availability, you know, because they're obviously not in every state. Okay, so you lived in Arkansas, and obviously the Titan right. II is in Arkansas, Arizona, Kansas, right? right. So you chose a Titan II because of um, proximity, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the, you know, I wanted to do a project like this, but you have to have it in a place, you know, that's easily accessible, so at least you're wife or in this case ex-wife can see the see the family <laughs> it became ex-wife <laughs> became ex-wife yeah. yeah that's why you should never buy a missile silo <laughs> okay viewers red flag number one choose the right partner <laughs> i always thought it was a guy things and a lot of times i'm just thinking forward and uh, when i had people come visit and if the wife came it was always the killer of the deal always so go on finish your story no no i was just uh no but i you know i like titan too it's yeah. uh it's uh, the most hardened facility you can buy, I think. It's uh, most hardened, but it doesn't have a doesn't have a silo. It has a silo, but they exploded the um, right. the, the top thirty feet. So why is a Titan II a still why is it still a good proposition? So it depends on what a person wants to do, okay. right? That's that's really you have to back into that. If you want a, a nightclub for four thousand people, you know Atlas F and Titan II are the right they're the wrong choice. But if you want to turn it into a house, which is what a lot of people want to do, yeah. you still have about four thousand square feet of space. It's effectively nuclear proof, any kind of modern nuclear. And the plant. house you're referencing is the LCC, the Launch Control Center. Right. You can turn the Launch Control Center into a. And the Titan nice II is a, it's a, it's a dome, it's a three level dome, yep. right? And so you've actually converted yours into what? Like an Airbnb? Yeah, I mean, first it was a, the idea was turned into a house that, yep. for the family, and then, you know, life changes, so we ended up on a, on a path, and now we do, we do any kind of event there. So we, whatever people want to pay for that's semi legal. We do there, including a lot of our B&B work. Nice. Yeah. And are there any plans for the silo? We sort of just I have lots of plans for the silo. Yeah. Uh, so explain what actually what the, what the government did back when it was uh, decommissioned in the, uh, the 1980s. Yeah, one of the problems with Titan II, the biggest downside of Titan yep. II, is that because they were decommissioned in the 80s instead of the 60s, like Titan One and Atlas F. Yeah. Uh, You're part of the SALT Treaty. Right, it's part of the treaty, so they had to blow up the access portal, fill some of it in with concrete, blow up the top of the silo like you mentioned. So they're a lot harder to get to. The upside is, is that that tends to make the initial purchase price cheaper. Yep. So, you know, I paid 90,000 for mine. The last two that were purchased are in the four and 500,000 dollar range, but yep. those are also ones you can walk into, you know, 
like you said, you, can, right. you walk into it and see what you're going to buy first. Yeah. Mine was completely sealed up full of water. It was all a crapshoot. So Bruce, why an Atlas F? Well, I didn't even understand what an Atlas F was. <laughs> and okay. the person that I got involved with initially had a partner. He said, hey, you can buy these missile bases. And I go, missile bases? Like water missile bases. So I, I flew my plane up to a near airport uh, in near Plattsburgh and we drove out. And oh, it was a lot of debris and government stuff. And then a stairwell that came out of the ground. And you could walk down two steps, it was just water. So I didn't even know what it was. Right. And so he ended up uh, purchasing it. And he, during this time, he had no money, no budget, college kids, you know. And he, and he finally got a, spent 50 bucks on a water pump, sort of pumping it out. And um, so, it was, so just, it was just a mess. It was just, I think, drywall turning to just smuck and craziness. And finally, when he set, cleaned it out a little bit, it was just all a mess. He's, so you're still working your way to the RCC at this stage, right? Right. So he says that he had, but it wasn't just like a little lot. Like a lot of these uh, properties ended with 10 acres. There was actually a, 125 acres there, and it was an old access road. And myself being a pilot, I said, you know, so the first thought wasn't anything to do with them doing something with the missile base, but doing something with the land. Because it's an Adirondack State Park, it's not far from world-class skiing and you know, a lot of things going on. Great fishing, hunting, everything like that. So I, um, I said, I bet you I could land my plane. I remember getting a measuring tape and measuring it. It was 2,050 feet. So was there already a tarmac where the Atlaseth was? And there was a tarmac clear area. It was very convenient once again, too. Right. So, yeah, and I, in the silo, I hadn't even been in it yet. Yeah. So when I finally, uh, he funded it initially a little bit, and I went up there, and I said, okay. I was up there all along, I was looking around, I go, the first thing was, I got to build a house. Yeah. And that was the first thought. And so I, I didn't know anything about pulling permits in that area or anything. So I called the local building department, and he goes, ah, just send me a floor plan to check for 85 bucks on your set. <laughs> It was crazy. I, you know, as being a builder, things have changed significantly since then. Yeah, well, it depends on where you're at. Well, yeah, well, yeah, and then, and then, as a floor plan, you'll be fine. It's okay. We'll come. And so, you know, here we got 125 acres, and I, and the excavator came out that day, and I said, okay, let's. I, I drew plants myself, and you know. So you built a house on top of the axis. No, no, no. This was nothing to do with the silo. The okay. silo wasn't in the picture yet. It was just there, okay. and that's how we got our power because my my partner had powered it up a little bit, so I, I can access. My first so you're extracting your power from the actual Atlas F itself? That's where I got the power to build the other house initially for construction. So I, I built this, you know, cool house. And then I realized, I go, you know what? Before we do anything else, we have to do something with this missile base. We have to, that makes it a cool home. And I've got to pre-frame this right now. So Bruce was doing this back in the late 1990s. I mean, talk about like an idea for the Atlas right? This was 96. 95. 95, right? 95, yeah. Yeah, so you started, started the Atlas F in 1995. Right. I mean, it's 2022 right now. Um, GT, you started your adventure in, what, 2010? And yeah. And took you about seven, eight years, for example. Sure, we'll go with that. Yeah. So, you, okay, so you, so you finally discovered the silo. Then you found out it was an Atlas F. You started to study up about it and what have you. Yeah, so over the years, I became more of a missile base expert, meaning I gave a lot of interviews and tours. Yeah, television, television forward, media, you know? yeah. And so I said to my partner, I said, let's build this cool home. And so we had no idea. And I said, well, let's not just, let's make the silo disappear. So I said, well, we'll build a house on the surface and, and integrate the stairwell into the plants. Right. And so really, it was so interesting because some of the showings going forward, uh, I would show a lot of people and they'd fly in and, I, and they, they would tell the, the person who's coming, don't tell them it's a silo. So they were really freaked out because yeah. they'd never seen it. No one's ever seen anything like that. So it was just a home and I go, and I got to the point, I go, hey, check out my basement. I got a really cool basement. Okay, go that, ahead. That's what's going to make a difference. All right. Now, this enters a whole other world. And these people, if you not, weren't expecting to see a missile base yeah. or anything. And the basement you're referencing is the LCC, which is actually two levels on an Atlas set. We're all do, LCC, so, three levels. So, yeah, you see, you see that's one of the advantage of the uh, Titan II site is the stairwell. That's built into it with the Atlas F. But we built um, the whole house around that, so the stairwell disappeared. And it was more like a door to go, hey, let's go to my basement. And if you had no idea you were about to see a missile base or anything to do with that, and um, you go to the door and you start walking down these stairs and you keep going, people were freaking out. They couldn't talk. Yeah. They were just so freaked out. That was amazing. No, definitely. They weren't expecting anything. Yeah. 
So here's the thing here. So with the LSF, we're now, we're now decommissioned. So the Title I and the LSF was both decommissioned both in 1965. So McNamara, who was the, uh, uh, he was like the Defence Secretary at the time in 64, he basically said, okay, so the LSFs and the Title Ones are going to go. And then the Titan II became the, uh, the successor, you know, for that period of time. So the, the, so the silos in the LSF and the, um, the Titan Ones, they, were, they, were, they, were, they remained intact. And your LSF actually had a crib. So the crib was basically, the crib pretty much contained the actual nuclear missile, for example, of you. So in, in essence, what it was, it was, a, it was a stairwell going into the surface. You had a 42 foot cylindrical structure, 35 feet tall. And, and the idea, of course, is the crew would survive the direct nuclear hit. The downstairs was all the computer rooms. The upstairs is where the crew would live. And then you have a 50 foot tunnel that went to the silo tube, which yeah. was 52 foot diameter, 185 feet deep. And within that was a seven level skyscraper, the crib, the crib yeah. which was suspended by four huge 60 foot long shock systems. Yeah. And that's where the, um, so in effect, it was just a storage for the missile because the, what they would do is they would open these two, I think they're like 20 ton doors, 50 ton doors and they would raise the whole launch pad to the surface through a counterbalance system and try to hit Russia. Yeah. That's the essence. So the difference is in the LSF, I mean, it'd be hydraulically raised to the surface and then launched. So it's like a 25, um, you know, it's almost like a 25 minute process because I have to put the RP-1 in there, the LOH tanks in there, fuel it, send it up to the top elevator and then launch it. Where the Titan II, um, that could, they could shave off 25 minutes and it can launch within what, about 90 seconds? Because it'll launch within the actual silo itself from inside all the way to its intended target, um, you know, 6,000 miles away. Yeah. So it's been 90 seconds and it was a hatch that went across. So when you get orders and turn keys, 58 seconds later, it should yes, That's crazy. So the Titan II had like a, almost like a 600, was a 600 ton, uh, almost like a, like a silo door, and it'll, it'll basically slide Just slide over, yeah. And then uh, it'd be launched from within. Pretty so, amazing. But we don't dream. It took a lot of systems to get that to launch from inside though. Yeah. You have to have exhaust for it. It had a huge deluge, what's called a deluge tank. Yeah. So the acoustics, the missile would actually destroy itself because the rocket from the, when, the, when the engines do. So it has a 100,000 gallon tank that shoots water in there. And that actually is an acoustic dampener. Right. To keep the missile from blowing itself up in silo. Were they able to be reused then? Let, let's say no, remember. one shot. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, what, plus probably on the receiving end of it, of yeah. this too. So. Oh yeah, as soon as you launch, you, you, you become the recipient <laughs> yeah. from the other side, from the other nemesis. The Soviet Union, you know. So here's a question over here. So if you were to buy a Titan II today, what would you do differently? I mean, like, you know, obviously, you get, um, there was a lot of, um, you know, some turbulent waters out there. I mean, I, I'm sure you guys, there was, there, was, there, was, there was probably like a period of time where you both wanted to like give up. I mean, you, you do require like a, re, a level of resilience and perseverance because your silo got flooded, what, how many times? Twice? After you pumped all the water out, it got flooded. You also had water issues, I mean, you know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but uh, what would you have done differently? If you were to buy one today, what would you do differently? I'd have more cash up front because you did end up doing things multiple times. So the example I always use is the stairwell. Yes. We started with it, right? You started with a ladder, and then we had a spiral that I bought cheap, but it wasn't tall enough, so you strap a ladder to it. Then we built a spiral, so a 35 foot spiral, which is not comfortable. And then we built the final stairs, which are, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, but I could afford a $20,000. So you stairs. think that cost you about 100 grand? No, well, all my mistakes probably cost me 100 grand. Yeah. So all the, like, I went through five types of sub pumps because this you know, well known manufacturer failed repeatedly. I found one kind that I've had one failure in 12 years. Right. You know so, what I finally figured out? We use well pumps. Right. They work fine. That's right, what they work fine. That's what they're made for. Yeah, obviously they're, they're, they move water slowly, but if you need to move water slowly, like in your silo. Yeah, exactly. But, um, yeah. That, because we tried staging it, we did all that, but the well pump did the job, and they did what you're supposed to do, and it, and yeah. it never failed. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's what we learned, because we went through a lot of pumps, too. Yeah. yeah. What about um, scrap? So, well, actually, let me answer that. Yeah. Well pumps don't work in Titan IIs, at least in Arkansas, and here's why. The inflow of water is faster than a well pump can handle. So, so well pumps are, you know, four gallons per minute or something like that. That's how the fl inflow is that much. Huh? Right, because of what Nick was saying about the top of the silo being blown up. Arkansas's water table is so high, oh, it actually creates a waterfall right. inside. Yeah, good point. So. When we had cheap pumps from uh, your local big box store, you'd have a pump in there and the water was still rising. 
So you're like, well, shit, how do I fix that? So you have to have bigger pumps. They won't, now well pumps will go really deep, which ours wouldn't, or you can get up with really expensive pumps, but you know, the flow is a lot higher. Mm -hmm. So that's why we had to, and have almost used just a lot less, a lot obviously, of different pumps. Obviously a different problem I didn't have, because I didn't have right. to, yeah. Now if I was gonna empty a silo of water, like you had to do in the Atlas F, a well pump is the only thing you can do yep. if it, it's under 10 grand. Yeah because it's so tall. Yeah. So if anybody was looking at uh, a client like a Titan II, you, know, you also need to understand that in Arkansas, the, um, the long cableway still remains and you, you have yep. to basically build a bomb in Kansas we, uh, to stop any water coming from the silo. But the Arizona T2s, the Titan IIs, the, um, the long cableways were removed, right? Correct. Yeah, so obviously not all silos are the same. So with the LSF, I mean, what, what would you have done differently? If you were to buy an LSF right now, and the great thing about Nalaseth is well, untapped. I, I actually understand that because after I finished the silo and I, I, I found some investors and it's off the table, I acquired another one. And yeah. The biggest feature for me is it never had water in it. Yeah. And that was a big plus because you didn't have to deal with the moisture problems and the constantly dealing with water. And I said, well, if I'm going to do it again, I don't want water. Yeah, because the, the other one was in the Adirond deck in New York, right? So exactly. Talk about water here. So, I mean... So that, that was one of the bigger factors. Yeah. And, and, that, and to me, it's a huge selling point. And so that would, that would be the yeah. direction. Water is a constant battle. I mean, here in the, uh, this Titan one, you know, we've done like a brief tour thus far, but this Titan has 4.5 million gallons of water in the actual silos and the propeller terminals and the, uh, the equipment buildings. So it's 4.5 million gallons is a shitload of water. So, uh, sorry, water, you guys say. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, apart from like, you know, you're going to need a lot of uh, water pumps, sump pumps. Um, what about um, scrapping? Did you have any scrapping? Did you have to like scrap anything, like metal wise? Did you get some scrappers in there with uh, uh, No, we uh, actually cars? didn't. Uh, well, my partner I had, he cleaned up a lot of the, the, the monk and the gunk and five gallon buckets carrying it out. And I'm not sure what he did with it. Right. Know? Because when I came in, it was just a mess, but a lot of the bulk crap was out of there. Right. So I still had wet metal and rust and still crap. So there wasn't a lot of scrapping, and any asbestos was in the silo where it was contained and it was moist in there, so it was never a factor. Right. But, you, but, but with your silo, you, um, you, it's still pretty much a crib. I mean, all, no, the, unless you plan on like building, you know, uh, apartments, all that kind of thing, it's going to require like scaffolding to like scrap all that, that crib, for example. So obviously, um, you know, the crib's kind of cool, but you know, how are you going to monetize at the end of the day? I mean, the other missile base I have, uh, it's, um, it doesn't have any metal in the side of the tube. That's some scrap. Yeah. It's cleaned down to the bottom. There's debris obviously needs to be removed right. at the bottom. So that was a plus. That's too. a nice clean approach and it's dry because the water table is obviously a lot lower, right? Yeah, I don't have to deal with that. Just remove the debris yeah. and it uh, looks like most of the asbestos is out of there. That's good. And JT, what about, um, so how would you approach, for example, like sandblasting or, you know, a dustless blaster utilizing recycled media <laughs> or like a commercial pressure washer with like 5,000 psi? Which one would you use? Well, I used all of those. Okay. So I bought a huge four-cylinder, six-cylinder Allison diesel pressure water uh, sandblaster. So we hauled media down and we started it. And the problem with a regular traditional sandblaster, not in this room, but like your tunnels, you stop, you can't see. Yeah. The in you know thirty seconds after you're blasting, there's you all the air is full of dust. Well, you using like a negative air pressure machine to like just filter. I, I mean, you can, but that's still you have to push a massive amount of. of uh, you know, the media is a lot, it's a lot of media. So we tried that for a little bit. Plus you have to pull all of your media out. Anything you do inside a business a lot of do, yeah. is, anything that goes in or anything that goes out is a, it's a lot of work. So like you talk about salvaging, right? It's unbuilding a ship in a bottle, Yeah. right? Everything you have in here has to go through in the grand scheme of things, a pretty small area to get out. Yeah. And that's the same problem. But where I ended up was pressure washing. Okay. So. Really hot water, like you know, you have machines. It, Explain it, the jet on the right. So the pressure washer. So you're don't go to your box store and get one. You go to uh, a proper one. It's five thousand psi, five gallons per minute, which is a high flow, high pressure, and then it's got a ceramic needle point. So it's a needle that'll cut you, but it actually turns like a turbine. Yep. The water pressure makes it turn. Yep. So it makes little circles. Yep. But so fast you can't see them, and it'll peel most anything off. Let me ask you here, these concrete walls here, I mean, if you have pressure washers, should, should, 
I mean, the goal is to, to be able to paint maybe afterwards or make it look good. Yeah, absolutely. I that, do like to call that's actually what he did. He actually pressure washed everything and then he, and he drained it, he dried it, and then two part epoxy paint. Yeah, on the walls. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even uh, the paint I went to. I went to Sherwin Williams and I said, "Hey, what kind of paint for concrete? What for metal?" And did that, you treat the metal once? Once you used the other pressure washer, did you? Uh, how did you treat the metal? I used uh, a, a primer called Chem Chromic. Yeah. Again, I feel like I'm sponsored. And was it was that within like a two day period? Otherwise, it oxidizes it again, right? So you do like within two days. Uh, Is it a primer. Correct, but the Chem Chromic also has like a rust inhibitor in it. Right. So you just have to paint within between two and fourteen days afterwards. But it's. It's not as complicated as it sounds. Yeah. It's again once you get the you have to have the right profile. So if this if it's too smooth, it won't take paint. But I didn't have that problem with the steel right. and the concrete. Did you sand down any of the surfaces or no? No, we didn't have to do any of that. And that's again, I went into it without the testing. That's why I spent too much money on a sandblaster and the work and the labor to do it. But in retrospect, I would never buy one. And I looked at the same thing you did, those dustless blasters. So yeah. basically has media embedded with the water. Exactly, yeah. uh, sounds great, but it's you have to get all that waste out. Yeah. And that's Can you suck it out with some, you know, because it's water and like, like a water pump? You know? Sure. Yeah. It's gonna destroy the pump over time because yeah. it has all the media in it. It's yeah. part of the job. Right. So your impellers, you know, you're gonna lose impellers left and right. Uh, but yeah, you can do it. But I would just try the sand. I mean, that sandblaster is three to five grand. You know, in the grand scheme of a project, it's pretty small. It's pretty yeah. cheap, so give it a try. So, what about budgets? I mean, you know, I mean, I'll, it, we'll show the viewers some of the, um, the the final results. You know, we've um, with what you guys have manifested and what have you. I mean, what sort of budgets for like an LSF? Obviously, assuming they're not going to renovate and you know um, fit out the other silo. Because the silo, that's, a, that's like a 10, 15, 20 million dollar proposition for like an LSF. Absolutely. Because 185 feet, 52 feet. Um, to get into a, a tiny two silo, you're looking at about a million dollars just to get into it, to remove all the uh, debris, oh, to I rebuild the top. Dollars? Come on. No. Oh, sorry, for the silo, yeah, yeah. If you were to go down that road, for example. Oh, for the I mean, silo, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and then possibly another 10, 15 to like, you know, if you can like deck it out, like just go, like, oh, yeah. go all mighty on it kind of thing. So budgets wise, for the RCC and for the Tiny 2 RCC, like what sort of expected budget can somebody like, um, you know, Are you, get their head around? You, you, once it's actually cleaned up? Yeah, once it's cleaned up. Oh, well, that's really, I always tell people. Like, let's say this, so um, let's say, you know, uh, a normal, you know, let's say some remediation, um, you know, setting all the walls, pressure wash, and then, you know, getting power, water, sewage, you know, some pumps, and then getting into like, a, like an Airbnb type, um, well, for us, we had to build a surface home, and I would yep. say, what do you want to build? Do you want to build a 500000 or a $2 million home on the surface? And I always give people that range yep. for the, the surface home. And then downstairs, I would say, depending on your taste and the technology you want to put in there. So it's really, I always say, I'm really just remodel the basement in a sense. So I would say the budget would be four fifty to 800000 for the downstairs, depending on what your taste yep. and, and things are. And downstairs, is, we're talking about two levels of an LSF. And for a Titan 2, I mean, because obviously, if you go to titanrange.com, you can also rent out your facility, uh, your RCC for like, I believe, what, $400 a night or something? Yeah, somewhere there. Yeah. Uh, depends how many views this gets. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> price might go up. No, but I mean, budget wise. Yeah, prices. <laughs> prices like poker just going up. <laughs> you know, you're in the. So again, it's about. 3,500, 4,000 square feet. So if you talk about per square foot, you know, on the cheaper end, you can do it for 50 bucks a square foot, right? Yeah. I mean, that's not super nice, but you're livable. You have working electricity, bathrooms, um, pretty simple. I think I probably spent probably 150 a foot uh, on the actual inside. Yeah. Uh, so in so sense, your numbers sound but, 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 but Right, exactly. But in a sense, I always thought of this. You don't have to build a roof. You don't have to build a foundation. Right. And you just have to build into it. You're building, like you're remodeling. You're just a balance. That's all you're doing. Right. Balancing on a clean slate. Yeah. Yeah, but there's also, there are some offsetting expenses a little bit. Septic systems are more expensive. Yeah. You, know, you get like, a sewage injection. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, electrical for me, I, I, mean, I agree. In some ways, electrical was cheaper because you don't, nobody has to crawl under house. Nobody, you don't have to get in the walls. <laughs> 
it's all my conduits are all built right onto the concrete. Folks, there's no termites. <laughs> yeah, right. It's always kind of fun when you go, you ever been into a store, like a home building store, and they're like, hey, I'd like to, are you interested in a new roof or new windows? I'm like, I don't have either of those. And you just keep walking, <laughs> and they just, just like, what? Are you, what? Do you have windows or a roof? Okay, so here's a question of you. So what existing infrastructure did you use and did you incorporate with your current design? The only infrastructure I used was the, the septic tank. Um, so the original one? Right. My, my place had been underwater for 25 years. Uh, plus it has way more conduit than you ever need in, in an yeah. actual living facility. So or for a while I used the original pumps, which like everything in a government facility is really overbuilt. So I put new motors on it, use the pumps, but they're really loud and they actually leak, which is a real bad thing in septic. Yeah, actually, yeah. I found out from the Titan II crew members that it leaked back in the operation. Okay. So I actually bought a pretty, you know, $1,200 septic pump. It's half as fast. It'll empty the 500 gallon tank from 50 feet underground in about four minutes. So, I mean, that's, that's plenty. You know what I did? I, I used to actually septic area, but I put a separate in, enclosed new tank inside that yeah. and used that instead. Yeah. Uh, I did that for, we have another set of bathrooms that we put in the access portal that weren't ever there. So I used the exact same thing. It works right. One thing, uh, GT, you probably agree with me on is that here we are, we both challenged something that no one's really done. So we had, there wasn't like we had a, we can be, uh, be consulted by anybody. No. We just had to figure things out. It wasn't a procedures manual. We you just, had, just we basically had, it was like ad hoc, ad lib, and you it, guys basically. It you wasn't like I could go to an engineer and have a hooking help yeah. me out with this. No, there was nobody. And, and they were just, you know, they, they had goat eyes yeah. <laughs> for the most part, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, there's trial and error there. So oh, yeah. for sure. The, ups the only upside I had is being on a little bit lower budget is it took me more time, so I had more time to think through what I was going to do. And I avoided a lot of mistakes. A lot of people, you know, if someone handed me a check for half a million dollars to go build one, it'd be fun, let's do that. Yeah. But you have to have a plan going into it. You have to think through a lot of things to make it yeah. useful. But, but, but also you can't be a weekend warrior and live out of state. You've got to live at the property and just go all in. Right, or you're hiring you just a contractor. Yeah, I mean, it's because one get done. I mean, one of the good examples that we haven't talked about yet, which is, uh, building in a circle is a pain in the ass. Yeah. Anything that's a circle. Now, I didn't. I haven't really seen your things, but what I did was I do facets and eight foot facets. Right. And and that was my circle, you know, and that's how I did it. And so, I didn't use the outer walls. The I built an inner shell within the outer shell, and so when you access it from my inner shell, I would actually that would be my basement in a sense. Is that what you did? No, I actually, the only two rooms that we built were two commode rooms. All right. Everything else, we kept the original structure. So our springs, our floors are still steel. We kept all of that. Uh, the downside is it's not well sealed, meaning if you are on level one talk, talking, someone on level three can hear you because there's gaps, you know? I would say that's one of the biggest differences between what he did and I did. Because I, I built an inner shell and I, I, I built within that. Yeah, it was, for me, it was a balance between to make it look as nice as possible, absolutely, yours is, you'd be the way to go. Mine has kind of a, it has an industrial feel, but I tried to warm it up some, you know, with, not literally, but figuratively, you know, nice furniture and woods. Yeah. And, I think you chose a really good color scheme. I like your color scheme. My wife did that. You, really? The new one, yeah. Because you got the orange, you got, you got your orange, you got your gray. Yeah. Um, some nice blues also, in there. Look. And also you got some nice glass doors that are very impressive. You just need like a doorbell, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to say you're talking about why is uh, it sounds like you lost one and you gained one. <laughs> but mine, she stuck with me, and she was down there. She lived down there with you. Right? She, I, I remember that it was so funny the first night that we were on the surface home, and we were actually staying there the first time, and we were going downstairs to go to bed, and but you know she. Did was, you have an operational toilet at that stage, or was uh, it a topside? Was that operation? Uh, operation? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, it was a beautiful uh, master bath with okay, a so you, tub. It was, okay. Yeah, it was nice and it was warm. You know? yeah. Well, I didn't lose the wife keep, because keep, of, keep them warm. I, I don't think I lost the wife because of the missile silo. I think I lost it because of the type of person that has a missile silo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that may be a different thing. Well, no, but my my current wife, our first date was or fourth date was watching a movie on level three. Yeah. So she kind of knew what she was getting into, sort of. Hold on, did well, you watch The Day After or War Games? No. Or did I, you watch it? She, it's a fourth date, she picked it, of course. She picked, it was fried green tomatoes, she picked the movie. <laughs> you know what, it's interesting you were talking about why is it all that, so. My partner, I remember he would pick up a girl, you know, 
and because he would be staying there too, and he would bring her back and didn't tell her where it was. Is this like dating advice right now or what? No, <laughs> so, so they, you know, but I remember he saying, I said, well, let's go. So guys, if you want to impress, get a missile no, sign. No, 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 but, but she, she didn't know. And so she, here he'd be walking down the stairs and, he, and she goes, oh, uh, am I going to be okay? Are like, you a serial killer? You know, like, uh, it's like Silence of the Lambs, part three. Yeah. <laughs> no, I always told, like, if I was going on dates, I would always say, text a friend, let them know you're going to be underground. And it's no single. Oh, you have Wi Fi, so yeah. You have no weirdness down there, so, yeah. <laughs> you have Wi Fi down there? Of course. Of course, this guy is yeah. a Wi Fi. Well, I, I know, I, yeah, no, I got to. Yeah. Awesome. So, any other things? Any other points? I mean, like, oh, this, yeah, go ahead. Other attributes, for example, like, I mean, you know, would you entertain a Titan two, and would you entertain an Atlas Surf to like fit it out? Would you? I've always liked the idea of your command center because it's three floors yeah. and there's a lot more possibilities and it's a bigger space. But then I would be presented with the challenges of that versus what I had. I had more of a, a strict cylindrical structure with a flat top. You have a dome top. Oh yeah, and, but, and that would be different for me. But I would have to think. The dome top's pretty tall, so like I'm six feet, so I can stand next to the wall, and my head won't hit the dome. Yeah, so, but, but I, again, I enclosed everything in. I did. Right. I did show some of the top, but I everything's enclosed in on mine. Matter of fact, even the floor is built up off the steel. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. yeah. So GT, can we sway you to can we sway you to the LSF side? The silo is very impressive. But you have to again. You have to have the research. And here's the other problem with a, a silo. And this is when people ask me if I'm going to do my silo. You have to build from the bottom up. So you can't do like, oh, I'm going to build one floor, and then if I no. get bored later, I'll build down. Yeah. You kind of build yourself in. Not necessarily because of well, you don't. the consideration of the silo, too. We were going to just drop it down one. We put some I-beams going across, and just we were just going to build it there and just not use the whole yeah. part of it. And it would have been a much more digestible job. Correct, yeah. Yeah, but that was our thinking. That's my point though, is you say two years from now, you're like, oh, I really like to build below. You painted yourself in a corner where it's really hard to get all your structure down yeah. through the floor you've already made. Exactly, but also if you're gonna go the silo route and actually just start to develop it, you're gonna need at least 100 to $150,000 worth of scaffolding. You know, just to like clean it all out and you know, I'm sure there's this piping at conduit, like there's the whole debris field. I mean, specifically like with the other sets, there's usually a debris field, you know, the last 10, 15 feet down the bottom. Assuming it's already been drained out, for example, too. Oh, it's a crazy project. Yep. It is. Awesome. So, gentlemen, absolute pleasure. I mean, great intrigue. I mean, I, you know, I was first introduced to your channels before, even, you know, before I started my due diligence and research and what have you kind of thing. But, um, GT, the, uh, the OG of the Titan 2, and uh, Bruce Francisco, the OG <laughs> of the Atlas Surf. So, guys, thank you very much. For sure. And yeah. welcome to the Titan 1. Yes. This thing's crazy, man. It's it nice. Crazy. It's mammoth, isn't it? It's it's just, it'll, it'll humble My first time here, I got lost. It was in the middle of the night, and uh, yeah, I, I had the blueprints on my phone. So, like, yeah, it was like following, you know, following the popcorn trail, but uh, I got lost twice. Yeah. yeah, I uh, I never follow the popcorn trail, but that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I don't even. This place is uh, it's overwhelming. It is, it's, it is definitely. There's a lot to it, and um, I'm gonna give you guys a, a sneak preview. I'll take to uh, I'll take to the uh, R1, the uh, the equipment building, the propeller terminal, and I'll show you one of the actual silos. So, gentlemen, shall we do it? Yes. Good. Let's do it. Thanks. Awesome.